this morning, we are back in the book of Acts. In a book study that has been maybe my favorite book study that we have been in in the 10 years we have existed as a church. And we find ourselves in chapter 21. Chapter 21. The title of our sermon this morning is Committed to God's Will Regardless of the Cost. Committed to God's will regardless of the cost. Our text is chapter 21, verses 1 through 16. And the main lesson that we're going to really spend the, the majority of our time on this morning is that it is costly to walk in obedience to God's will. If I could take all 16 of these verses and put it down into a short summary sentence, that would be it. It is costly for you and I to walk in obedience to God's will. And so my prayer this morning is twofold. First, that you will remain steadfast in walking in obedience to God, regardless of what it costs you personally. So for those of you that came in the doors this morning and you know you are exactly where God wants you to be and you are serving Jesus in the exact way that he wants you to serve him, my hope and prayer this morning for you is that you would remain steadfast and that you would be encouraged by Paul's resolve that we see in this text. And my second prayer this week has been for those of you who have walked in the doors living selfishly, that you would realize this morning that living selfishly is not living at all. Living life as if life revolves around you, not about a God who created you, is not living life at all. So before we get into this text, let's take just a moment and set it in its proper context. The book of Acts was written, and by the way, everybody that's been here for the last 18 months ought to be able to say this, okay, because I say it every week. But the book of Acts was written to show us the expansion of the early church through the Acts of the Apostles. It is a story of how God took normal everyday people, living normal everyday life, and how he used them mightily to expand the kingdom. In the first few chapters, we see the pouring out of the Spirit onto the apostles. We see the overflow of that pouring out of the Spirit in their lives as God worked through them at Pentecost seeing thousands of people born again. So the church was established. Then through persecution, the church began to spread and move. Paul himself, back when he was known as Saul, was the main persecutor of the church, which we'll get to Philip in this text. And one thing I love about this text is the reason why Philip, the evangelist, is where he is is because of Paul's persecution in the church back when Philip was proclaiming the gospel. Isn't it funny how God takes enemies and he makes them friends? Paul's converted in chapter 9. Chapter 13, the church at Antioch sends Paul and Barnabas, two of their best men, out on their first missionary journey to start churches. Paul comes back, reports back what they did in planting churches. Then they are sent out again on a second missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas at that point in time split over a conflict. And then Paul comes back once again. And here we find Paul on his third missionary journey. And if you remember the context, Paul had made his way from Ephesus all the way around the region of Achaia and Macedonia. He had collected funds. And if you remember, he's collecting funds because there are saints back in Jerusalem who were poor and desolate and who desperately need some relief. There's also a church back in Jerusalem that has a Gentile group and a Jewish group. And Paul wants to come and merge those groups together so that they can see that the gospel unites them and brings them together under the banner of the gospel. And so Paul's got two main reasons to get back to Jerusalem. To bring financial relief that he collected from the churches of Macedonia and Achaia and to see the unity of the church there in Jerusalem. That's his primary concern and goal. And so now we pick up in chapter 21. Beginning in verse 1, and if you are physically able this morning, I'm going to ask that you would stand. In honor of and in reverence to the reading of God's inerrant, life-giving word. And I'm going to ask that you bear with me as I try to pronounce some of these words. And when he had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. 
For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at, at here's the word, Ptolemy's. And we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When he heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. And after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing to us the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would add your blessing to the preaching of your word. God, I know that this morning, God, it will accomplish nothing if the spirit is not moving and active in the hearts of believers. And so, God, we are dependent on you during this time. And God, we ask that you would take the truths found in this text and God, that you would use them to shape and comfort and convict. So God, I pray that I would speak the truths in the text, that I would stick closely to them and God, that you would speak through me to your church for the equipping of the saints and for the evangelizing of the sinners. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I wanna give you three lessons from the text. Three lessons that we see really just coming out of this. There's a lot, and listen, as I prepared this week, there is a lot running around in this text. And so I am very, very excited about what we find here. But the first lesson that we're gonna take note of this morning is that we must have an unrelenting commitment to God's will. I want you to go back and let's read verses one through three together again. It says, and when he had, the, had parted from them, that's the Ephesian elders, and set sail. We came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had come on the side of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. And, and uh, for there, the ship was to unload its cargo. And so we can look at the phrases here. The next day, another boat, we boarded another ship. What we see in this text is that Paul is relentless in his desire to obey God's will for him. If you see nothing else from Paul's travels in verses one through three, we need to take note of this. He was unrelenting in his commitment to God's will for his life. Earlier on in chapter 19 or maybe 20, Paul was constrained by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And in verses one through three of chapter 21, we see him in a relentless pursuit of that which God had for him, which was to get himself to Jerusalem to help the church that was there. He was on his way to Jerusalem to meet two needs, the needs of the poor and to unify a multi-ethnic church that was there. And so following God's will, what we learn early on in this text is that it takes persistence on our part. It is not passive it is active. And early on, beginning in verse one, we see that our dedication to God must surpass our love for others. Because if you look at the term parted here, it literally means to tear away in verse one. The word parted, when he's departing the Ephesian elders, it means to tear away. And it shows us the difficulty of Paul leaving those Ephesian elders. 
in the previous passage. And so our commitment and dedication to God's will must surpass our affection and love for others. I'm a people person. I love people. You can walk in my office any day this week that I'm in there, and I will stop whatever it is in the world I'm doing, and I'll have a conversation with you. It's actually a downfall of mine, okay, in a lot of ways. Uh, you can call me any day. I don't have lunch plans. Like, hey, let's go grab lunch this week. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm gonna, let's go grab lunch. Once again, one of my downfalls. I love people. But church, we have to love Jesus more. And what we see Paul doing with the Ephesian elders is we see a great affection for them in the previous text. They are weeping together. And Paul's parting from them. He's tearing away from them. You see, God put people in our lives to love and serve, not to worship. We worship and we follow Jesus alone. And then we see from Paul here that his obedience was immediate. There was zero hesitation with Paul's mentality and walking in God's will. There was no, I will serve him later in life. There was no, one day when the kids are out of the house and I get a little more time, I'll invest in the life of the church. No, we see none of that from Paul here. He was immediate in his obedience to God's will. You see, delayed obedience is not obedience at all. If I ask my kids to clean up and then I go back outside and see toys strolled all over the yard and they still haven't cleaned up and I say, hey guys, I told y'all to clean up. They say, we're gonna do it later. That's not obedience. And here from Paul, we see it's immediate. You see, obedience to God is doing what he says, when he says it, and doing it with a Christ-honoring attitude. And then throughout verses one through three, again, we had parted from them. We came by a straight course. The next day, uh, we went to Patara, having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia. We also see this, this steadfast spirit in Paul as well. He was going to where God wanted him to be and nothing was gonna stop him from getting there. You see, one thing is certain after the, reading these first few verses, and that is that Paul was steadfast in his pursuit of getting back to Jerusalem. Over the last two years, I have started exercise. I've never exercised in my life consistently before the last 24 months. And one thing I've learned about physical exercise for me is that it's not simply about physical exercise. Maybe more than anything else, it's about emotional and even spiritual health, right? It's a, it's a balance in my life. If I can work out, spend significant time in the word and in prayer and I can do work life and then do family life and keep all four of those things balanced, it really, really helps me. When one of those things gets out of balance, it affects all of the other things. But, and I work out almost every day, not every day, but just about every day. But understand something, there are days when I care nothing about putting on my hokas and going for a jog. There are days when that stupid box that I have in the corner of my bedroom that I'm gonna pull out and that jump rope, I know some of you are thinking right now, I didn't know you were a nine-year-old girl. That jump rope that I have, and like I, I want nothing to do with it, right? Like, like that desire is not there at all. But during those days when I do not want to work out, when I do not want to go for a jog, my dedication must surpass my desire. Listen, I know that dedication surpasses desire on days when I feel like I have nothing left to give, but I exercise anyway. I know that my dedication surpasses desire when it's 40 degrees and it's raining and I'm like, I've only got 30 minutes to do something, I'm gonna go jog in the rain. And some of you already know where I'm going with this, but for those of you who aren't tracking quite with me yet this morning, there will be days in your life when you do not desire to walk in obedience to God's calling on your life, when your desire is weak and it is frail. But during those days, your dedication to God and your dedication to what he has for you must surpass your desire to do it. And here's the litmus test for us all. Do you walk in obedience to God even when your desires are weak and frail? Do you get into the word when you don't have any time to get into the word? 
Do you spend time laboring with God in prayer when you really have no desire? See, some of you this morning are acting too spiritual for me, and you're acting like you always have this desire. But I know that we all share a common, common theme in our life, and that's that we're sinful. And there's going to be days when you do not desire the word and you do not desire prayer. And during those days, your dedication must surpass that desire. Paul in verses 1 through 3 shows us a steadfast spirit in walking in obedience to the God that he loved. He was relentless in his pursuit of God's will for his life. And he was distracted by nothing. You see, we live in a day and time where distractions become the focus not the mission and what God has called us to. And Paul's example here stands in stark contrast to the normal Christian life that we see around us today. The second lesson we learn in our text is that we must wrestle in community with others about God's will. Let's go to verse four and let's look. And having sought out the disciples, he stayed there for seven days and through the Spirit, They were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So we could spend a lot of time this morning discussing the places that Paul went on this journey and this march to Jerusalem. But I don't want to get caught up in all the details of where he went when the overarching lesson at all these places that he goes, the overarching lesson that he gives us is pretty clear. That is that being in community with other believers is essential to you and I if we're going to walk in obedience to God's will. It is essential to have biblical relationships. You see, many within our churches never experience the exhilarating joy of obedience because they refuse to open themselves up with others relationally. You may not know this, but your vertical relationship with God directly affects your horizontal relationship with others. Those two things, God not only reconciles us to himself, but he also reconciles us with others through the blood of Jesus. And then in verse four, we see an undeniable truth. And that is that we need to seek community while living on mission. Throughout chapter 21, Paul constantly sought out believers. He sought them out. That means that Paul didn't go to a church and think, well, they need to come and speak to me. Or he didn't go and say, hey, uh, I just need somebody to invite me into their home. Paul initiated this relationship. And I find it interesting that a chapter that deals so much with the will of God, at the same time, interlaces that theme of biblical relationships throughout the chapter. It teaches you and I that walking in obedience to God's will is not an individualistic thing but it's something that flows out of community. And I think one of the things we struggle with most in 2022 is this concept of living in community with others and doing life together with others. One of the things we struggle with as a church, this is the elephant in the room, we have grown tremendously. People don't know people. Our members don't know if this person's a member. This person doesn't know this family at all. People feel alone. And what we see here is that relationships must be sought. Look at verse four. Having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. That means that you must walk up to other believers and engage them in conversations. You need to take the first step in inviting someone into your home. You need to initiate a lunch meeting or a play date at the park. Don't wait on others to initiate the conversation. Seek it out. Seek it out. Because we cannot establish community ourselves if we're not willing to seek it, to cultivate it, and to work to maintain it. We also see that we need to allow community to speak into our lives. Go back and look at verse 4. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Now, Don't misunderstand what I just said when I said we need to allow them to speak into our lives. That doesn't mean we do what people around us tell us to do, but it does mean we do life together and we share. And if you read verse four, because if we read it again in verse 11 and 12, we find believers after discovering through the Holy Spirit 
what awaited Paul in Jerusalem, we find believers trying to convince Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But don't misunderstand these verses to say that the Holy Spirit was working through these people to direct Paul's steps. Paul had already received instructions from the Spirit. He'd already been constrained by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And these believers in this text, they are simply expressing concern over what awaited him when he got to Jerusalem. And so this would be like, this would be like me coming and saying, listen, God is calling my family to go overseas to a third world country. There would be people in this church, and even though I don't think you would question the call of God on my life necessarily, there would be some people say, hey, do you know where you're taking your family? Do you know the hardships that await you there? Do you understand what you're fully doing? That's what these brothers and sisters are doing with Paul in this text. They're telling him, the Holy Spirit has revealed to us the suffering that is awaiting you there, and just out of a genuine concern from you, don't go. Don't go. And Paul is allowing them to speak into his life, even though he disagreed with them. You see, we can have disagreements in Christ and still be brothers and sisters in Christ. See, discovering God's will here is not a, simply a private matter. It's also allowing others to speak and, and to work and to do life with others. Because if you look at verse six, and I love verse six. I, actually, let's back up to five. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, that's whole families, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed. You see, at the end of verse six, end of verse five, we find Paul praying with believers on the beach as he prepares to leave. And the goal of this prayer, and I love this, the goal of this prayer was not to get God's will to align with theirs. The goal of the prayer wasn't to say, God, stop Paul from going. It was an aligning of their will with God's. They were entrusting Paul over to God as he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And this is what we do as believers. We entrust and we give our friends and our family over to God, knowing that his plan for their life is better than the plan that we have for their life. You see, these believers knew the suffering that awaited Paul in Jerusalem, but they also knew that the only way to approach suffering was through the power of prayer. That was it. That was the only way to approach suffering was through the power of prayer. Tony Morita said about this text, he said, when diverse individuals kneel down before Jesus and do life together, it is a powerful testimony to the life-changing, friendship-forming power of the gospel. And it gets the world's attention. And then under this point, we see that we need to practice biblical hospitality within the context of community. Look at verse Four again, having sought disciples, we stayed there for seven days. Verse eight, on the next day we departed and came to Caesarea and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist. Look at verse 10. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came to us down from Judea. We see hospitality being practiced. The summer following my freshman year of college and the summer following my sophomore year of college, I did summer missions through our BSU in Northwest. Both summers, I went to Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, and I served as a summer missionary at Somerset Hills Baptist Church under Ted Harvey. He's still the pastor there today. And I remember I flew into Syracuse. By the way, the day before I left is when I found out I was going to New Jersey, not Syracuse, because I thought I was going to be in Syracuse all summer. My mom loved the change of plans, right? She was like, you're doing what? I'm like, it's actually in New Jersey, like 30 minutes outside of Manhattan, um, but I remember making that long ride from Syracuse to Baskin Ridge, New Jersey. Three, three and a half hours, maybe something like that, if I remember correctly. It was a cold, rainy day. And I walked into the home of Margot and Kevin Bushelon, who I had never laid eyes on. This is pre-FaceTime days. I had never met. And I had never spoken to on the phone. 
During those 10 weeks, Margo and Kevin Bushelon treated me as if I was one of their own children. And for the first time in my life, I saw how the gospel makes the foreigner family and how the gospel brings the stranger in to eat and have a seat at the table. I didn't know these people from Adam, whoever Adam is, that phrase. I didn't know these people were. But they welcomed me into their home. They gave me a bed to sleep in. I discovered this was cake rolls taste better frozen because the Bushelons freeze all of their little Debbie snacks. <laughs> Life changing. You can thank me later for that. Listen to me, church. In at least four places within our text, Paul spends significant time and stays with fellow believers. That means that these Christians in those places use their home and leverage their resources to show biblical hospitality. We do not get world-changing, culture-shaping Christianity apart from biblical hospitality. And so if you want to change your community, begin by having your community over to your home to share a meal one family at a time. Do not have the mentality that my home is my refuge and it's my hiding place from the world. It's your justification to avoid people. One commentary writer said about this text that biblical hospitality requires two things. Because some of you are thinking, well, what if I don't use my home, right? Two things. Biblical hospitality requires these things. A spirit of welcome and openness to making new friends and the actual sharing of resources. So you say, well, well, my home's off limits. I can't do it because of this or whatever. That's, that's fine. And a welcomeness to accepting new friends and a spirit of sharing resources. That's biblical hospitality. Take somebody to lunch. Meet up at the park for a play date. Hospitality is not simply come to our home. Hospitality is we do life together. So I want to encourage you to leverage the resources God has entrusted to you to practice biblical hospitality and to cultivate Christ-honoring friendships. Third lesson, and i got to get through this quickly. Third lesson we learn in our text is that we must count the cost of following God's will. In verse 9, we read about a prophet named Agabus. And he prophesied the same way everyone else had. He told Paul what awaited him in Jerusalem. And he demonstrated with Paul's belt the suffering that awaited him. And so what I want you to see this morning is that you and I, in order to walk in obedience to God's will, must count the cost of following him. And we must count the cost of following him regardless of what others might say. Because none of Paul's friends in this text wanted Paul to continue that march to Jerusalem. None of them did. And so we have to, to be committed to God's will, regardless of what others are saying to us. Now, that doesn't mean that we completely ignore what others say, but it means that we value what God has to say more. Because I want you to notice what Paul says in verse 13. When Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, Paul was not deterred in any way from walking in obedience to God's will. In fact, I would argue that, that Paul's resolve only grew stronger as the concern for his life grew more dire. And so what we see from Paul here is that we can love and respect people's views but we must love and treasure Jesus more. That's what we see. We love and respect people, but we treasure and love Christ more. You see, we also count the cost of following God's will regardless of what might await us. I've seen in my lifetime from student ministry and even being to East Point, you know, God do a work in a student's life. God begin to stir a student towards ministry or missions and it freaks parents out. It freaks parents out. Do you know why church folks get so upset or, I don't want to say upset, why they struggle with this concept of giving their children over to God and letting God call them to ministry or God call them to missions? Because if you've gone to church long enough, you know this about the church. The church is full of sinners. And the church will hurt and wound their own quicker than they will anyone else. 
And for years, I got frustrated with parents. I'd be like, just let them go. Let them do what God wants them to do. And now I'm a little more understanding as to why they hesitate. Not justifying it, but understand it. You see, ministry equals difficulty and suffering. And there is no way around the fact that struggle is inevitable for all who walk in obedience to God's will. But listen to me, church. This is the difference between believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers struggle and toil without the presence of God in their lives. Unbelievers go through life and they're gonna struggle anyway. They're just gonna struggle without God being with them. Whereas believers... They can march to their death as Paul did, knowing that his head was gonna be severed from his body, knowing that Jesus is always with him. In other words, Paul knew what awaited him there and he didn't care. He was willing to go. You see, we count the cost of following God's will because living apart from Christ is not living at all. Church, if you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. Do not spend your life trying to live life to the fullest, accumulating stuff, trying to go and have as many experiences as possible. Don't spend your life trying to do that when dying is gain. The Gospels give us a story. What is it? Profit a man if he gains everything in the world and forfeits his soul. You know what Jesus is telling us? It doesn't profit him anything. Better to live a life broke, a life of suffering, and a life of difficulty with God working in you and working through you and being with you every step of the way than it is to live a life being a multimillionaire and having everything you could ever imagine at your fingertips. You see, a life lived apart from Christ is no life at all. And the gospel plea from this text this morning is this. Die to yourself. Count your life as nothing and pursue after that which you can never lose, which is God himself. And so even though suffering may be inevitable for the believer, Jesus makes that suffering worth it because this life is not the end. For the believer, this life is nothing more than a precursor for eternity with God. The fellowship you enjoy with him, the time that you love being in the word, that time of prayer that you never want to end, guess what, brothers and sisters? There will come a day when you leave this world and it will never end. We'll always be with him. And that far outweighs anything you can get in this world now. When we see Christ face to face, no one who has ever given their life to him will regret it. No one. And then we see this. And man, I'm running out of time. Counting the cost of following after God's will, will profoundly affect those around us. Let's go to verse 14. Let's look at the the people who were discouraging him from going. And since we, or since he would not be persuaded, Paul would not be persuaded, we seized and said, let the will of the Lord be done. That's the theme of the text. And after these days, we got ready. By the way, Luke is using the words we hear a lot because Luke who penned this book is with them. We got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And look at verse 16. I love this. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us. Some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us. That means that Paul's obedience to the call of God, regardless of the cost, did not just affect his life personally. It actually affected those that were around him who said, if you're going there to have your head severed from your body, we're gonna go with you. This is Christ-like commitment. This is Paul's Gethsemane moment. 
Paul saying, I'm gonna go there regardless of the cost, and the people are looking around, and unlike the disciples who cowered and fled that night in the garden, these brothers and sisters said, hey, we're going with you anyway, and they went with them. John MacArthur said of this text, instead of their fears affecting him, his courage motivated them. His courage was contagious. And so I've got three points of application this morning, which my three points were application, but three points of application to close this thing out. Number one, resolve to walk in obedience to God's will for your life. This morning, if you've been struggling to walk in obedience to God, resolve today, commit today that you're gonna follow after God regardless of what he calls you to do. Put your yes on the table regardless of what that yes may lead to. Number two, treasure relationships, but ultimately treasure Jesus more. Treasure relationships. Your life over the last week, month, and year ought to be filled with having people over, going to lunches, doing life together, finding ways to encourage other believers. And so treasure relationships, but treasure Christ more. And number three, do not spend your life living for selfish gain when dying is the ultimate gain. That last point may sound profoundly theological, but I would argue that it is practically simple. Do not spend your life living for selfish gain when dying is the ultimate gain. In other words, don't live your life in pursuit of stuff. Surrender your life to the one who gave up the throne room of heaven, came to earth in pursuit of you. And so as we come to the time of invitation, the invitation is an opportunity for you, if you have never trusted in Christ, to repent of sin and to call out to a faithful God who will save you. The invitation is also a time for believers to reflect on the truths that God has impressed upon your hearts during this time and for you to respond in whatever way it is God is leading you to respond. This altar is open. It seems that oftentimes we don't take advantage of it, but it's open. It shows the entire congregation that God is stirring you and leading you to a place of repentance in an area of your life. And so you can come and pray at this altar. You can do business with God where you are, but I'm gonna pray and give you an opportunity to respond. Father, I love you. God, I pray that during this time you would bless the preaching of your word. God, I pray that you would use it in the lives of believers to encourage, to convict, and God, to comfort. And I pray for the unbelievers in the room, God, that you would draw them out. God, the people that have lived in pursuit of possessions and stuff, I pray that they would come to the end of that pursuit today. And God, I pray that your pursuit of them would come to an end as well as they surrender at the foot of the cross. God, move in this place. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Stand with me.